What a blessing. We can greet another time this side of the grave. And do this in the name of the Lord Jesus, who is King and Lord over all. I was thinking of reading some scriptures. If you all want to stand, um, you're welcome to. First one will be in Revelations 5, 5. Then they had this scroll they were trying to open, and they couldn't find anybody worthy to open the scroll. No one in three, and no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look into it. And I began to weep bitterly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or to look into it. Then one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. See, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. My point is, Jesus is worthy. He, he, he's worthy. Um, chapter 7. One, one more in five. So, maybe I'll start in 11. Then I looked and heard the voice of many angels surrounding the throne and the living creatures and the elders. They numbered myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands and singing with full voice, worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive power, wealth, wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessings. And then again in 13, to the one seated on the throne and to the Lamb, by blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen, and the elders fell down and worshipped. This is our, this is the King whom we serve. Now we go to um, chapter 7. They cried out the loud voice saying, Salvation belongs to our God who is seated on the throne and to the Lamb. And then from 13 to 17, Then one of the elders addressed me saying, Who are these robed in white and where have they come from? I said to him, Sir, you are the one that knows. Then he said to me, These are they who have come out of the great ordeal. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. For this reason, they are before the throne of God and worship Him day and night within His temple. And the one who is seated in the throne will shelter them. They will hunger no more, thirst no more. The sun will not strike them, nor any scorching heat. For the Lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd. He will guide them to springs of water of life. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. So here's this uh, shepherd that is we're serving. He's he's the one worth it. He's he's the one that is doing this. He's the one that gives us instructions. And then in chapter 19, 9. 
beginning in verse 9. And the angel said to me, write this. Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage lamb of the supper of the marriage lamb. And he said to me, these are true words of God. And then I fell down at his feet to worship him. But he said to me, you must not do that. I'm a fellow servant with you and your comrades who hold the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. For the testimony of Jesus is the pro spirit of prophecy. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Then I saw heaven open, and there was a white horse. Its rider is called Faithful and True, and, it's, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes are like fire, flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems. He has a name inscribed that no one knows but himself. He is clothed in a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. It's interesting. I thought I said he, nobody knows his name, but I say it's, his name is called the Word of God. And the armies of heaven, wearing fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses. From his mouth came a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the press of the fury of the wrath of the God Almighty of God Almighty on his robe and on his thigh he has a name inscribed King of Kings and Lord of Lords this is this is who we profess to honor and bow before I, I just wanted to remind us that that we don't forget um, I'm sure none of you do but uh, just remind that we we um, but he is our king so let's pray our father in heaven we thank you for the many blessings that you have given us and your that and especially Jesus whom you sent and whom was worthy to open the seals who was worthy of Doing your will, he was worthy of, of bringing your plan to us, and we thank you so much for that. We ask that you would put into our minds and hearts the things that help us to eternal life. Without you and your forgiveness and your help, we're nothing. We just want to ex exalt you and lift you up to be in charge of all of us here. We thank you for laying down your life for us and we, we, we give our lives to you to use and do with us as we, you please, as you see fit. Bless us, bless each one of us here we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. So, the question that comes to my mind is, are we ready to give ourselves up? Are we ready to surrender have we surrendered have we given our all have we come to the place where we don't care about anything else but that we can do the will of God I know sometimes we act as if we don't I know all of our desires are to do that but as a reminder that especially to myself but to all of us that we we need to press into this we need to we need to strive for this when we're singing that song uh, it has uh, that one song has in it uh, liberty and Calvary you know what Calvary stands for death are we ready have we died it's just 
I think it's just good to ask this question to our, our hearts. Or is there something in us that wants to have preeminent, uh, take charge, have preeminence over others, over, over the Word of God, over somehow we're going to be better than God or as good as God? I've mentioned this before not so long ago, but this is what Satan did. He wanted charge. He wanted to be in power. And he lied. He, he did all kinds of things to try to get his way. But in the end, he got thrown out of heaven. Not too far from where we read there in Revelations. Um, there was war in heaven. He was thrown out. No more room for him. I'm not sure when that happened. I kind of have this feeling it was the time of Christ when he was here. But, and before that, it seemed like he could come up to heaven, up to, up to God, assemble with God, and accuse the brethren, accuse us right there before God. I, my feeling is that he can't do that anymore. Jesus conquered him. But he's on earth. And his wrath is great. And he wants to devour each one of us. Uh, so, we can have liberty in Calvary. We can, have, we can s escape by death. If, if we give ourselves up, and we, we can escape by death. If we want to live and we want to, we, we're not willing to surrender ourselves we will have to um, be on, on the side of Satan. As I was thinking of some of these things, um, I thought of Caleb when he, um, uh, in, in Numbers 14, Uh, 24, he, uh, it was God speaking. But my servant Caleb, ha because he has a different spirit, has followed me wholeheartedly. I think that's something that David also had, this willingness to die. I think that's where the strength lies in. I believe this is what means by liberty and Calvary. When we, when we die for Christ, there's nothing that has any power over us. Nothing. And we were willing to die. Nobody can harm us. They can kill our body, but they cannot. They, they don't have a hold on us. But if we want to live... If we want to be it, he can he can work on us. He can he can interfere. He can he can just do so much damage to us. We may not even survive. God knows. We don't want to be there. We want to be in that place where we have died, where we have surrendered all. This is the only safe place for us. There's liberty in Calvary. Or the cross. Paul had to take that daily. And I feel like I have to too. And I suppose everybody probably feels that way. Every day we have to bring something to its end. We just, it's so... So opposite. My little take on on who's the least in the kingdom of heaven, I think it's Jesus because he's the greatest. Um, and I guess if you do it for him, then you're doing it for 
the least of these as well. He, Jesus said that as well. Anyways, uh, <laughs> um, I guess simply because I believe he's the greatest, then I guess he became the least somehow. And he was born of women. So that's, that's our challenge. That's why I said it. It's our challenge to become the least. And by it we become... Oh, how do, it doesn't say the greatest, does it? Great. Thank you. Uh, I didn't think it was the greatest, but I wasn't sure. It's okay if you're the least. But we won't succeed. We won't surpass Jesus. He's, he's, um, he's been perfect and we have not been perfect. We have made many mistakes. I have made many mistakes. Continue to make mistakes. And continue to have to ask God to forgive, for, to forgive put to death. Um, It's been kind of weighing on my mind. I, I, I feel a lot, uh, or feel like what Joseph said. It, I got many ideas, but I don't know what really is valuable. Or well, that's my words, I guess. But uh, I, I'm not sure what I know that others don't know, or what I could do to be a help and encouragement. And um, one thing, I, if nothing else, I would, it's for sure that we exalt Christ. I, if we put everything first for Him, and what we do is for Christ first, always, I, we won't go wrong. What I might suggest might lead you astray. What I might, the ideas I might have might be wrong. But what Jesus suggests are right on. There, he, didn't, he didn't make a mistake. He didn't... He kept the course to the end and he died in obedience. He became perfect in death. And uh, it's, <laughs> this, is, this is a hard thing. So we want to follow somebody, we want to follow a king, but we have to surrender all. We have to give up. And as I'm going to share some little things that I think are wisdom, not necessarily found in the Bible, but... Um, I was just thinking the times we live in, it just seems to me, it's been a burden to me that a lot of modern things have given us so many choices and it's not becoming less, it's been becoming more. That could all change again. Um, if we're sitting in a cell by ourselves, we'll have lots of, we'll have very little choice anymore in and what's going around us will be without dis many distractions. But we're not. We're here right now. And it could be 20 years. It could be 100 years. It could be 1,000 years. We don't know. We're, we're here today. And I'd like to make that point that let's not, let's not uh, be pointing into the future of what might be or could be or um, on the brink, like some people say. We're always on this brink, almost there. But... Usually it doesn't happen. 99% of the time it doesn't happen. So today is the day of salvation. I, I think we just win so much by living today in a way that is right before God. And that's at least where I want to be, I think probably all of us want to be there. And I just want to encourage us to do that. A few examples I thought of, I, I thought of, you walk into a store and I think about a cereal, to buy a cereal, and you get into this aisle and there's just like, anymore, there's probably a hundred different kinds there, maybe 200, I'm not, I've never counted. There's many. And I would, my own impression would be that some of them are not all that healthy, or most of them. But uh, 
There's choices we've been put into. When I was young, there's not near as many cho choices. There's like a few common ones. There was plenty already in my time, but not near what today there's just like, I, I, have, I don't know how many, there's just lots. And these, these choices, the, the point I would like to make is, is in all these things that we have, we have phones and we, we uh, when I grew up, a phone could do but one thing, that was to talk to somebody on the other end of the line. That was it. And my parents were concerned about people gossiping on there. I think maybe, I, I don't remember this, but I just had the thought this morning, I wonder if people accuse the people with phones to gossip. And it makes it a little bit easier to gossip. There's a little more responsibility there. But people gossip before phones. We need to always remember that. But by now, this is like 40 years later. That would have went all the way back to the early 1900s that for a long time phones could only be used to transfer, I guess they had, you could transfer emails and fax and stuff like that a little bit, but um, on the lines, but it was fairly simple. But now we have, if we have a phone, what they call a smartphone, there's many things we can buy on it, we can watch videos, we can talk, we can send pictures, we can have, actually can it occupy you all day long, seven days a week, if you're allowed to, it could. It is, is that big. And so, again, my point is that we use it rightfully and righteously. Um, sometimes it seems easier to just think, well, why not just get rid of everything? There's something easy about that, but then there's something very hard about it. I think when we have that mentality, we tend to be intemperate as well. Somehow, we are in this time and we have to learn to discipline ourselves. And the more we discipline ourselves, We, we can make better decisions or we need to make good decisions in what we have. And, and like cereal, we have to make the right decisions. We ha and if we don't care, we just buy, oh, I like, oh, this looks good. Or let the children pick it out if you want. They'll, they'll, oh, this looks good and that looks good and this advertisement's great. I don't, I don't see many advertisements of cereal if I ever did, but... Um, but if we do that, I think it's a mistake. If we do that with the phone, I think it's a mistake. I think if we do it with anything we have, it's a mistake. So, I believe we're in a tension. Like, we have, we just cannot, we just cannot throw ourselves from one side to the other. We have to learn to walk that narrow path right there in the middle that is right and righteous. not easy to do I'd rather we tend to rather want to go all one way and and then we tend to like even I think other people should do the same I think because we are in this this tension we have we need to give liberty to one another and if we think somebody's like way off into one side I think we should that's what brothers and sisters are for to to uh, keep us keep us accountable keep us uh, um, keep us where we where we can all better walk this path that is narrow and hard and difficult. It's almost like if you want to be a Christian, you don't have much to look forward to in this life, and it's just, I believe it's the truth. We are not, we're not here to try and pleasure ourselves. We, we, can, we can live in beauty. We can live in harmony with God's creation. But we're not here to trust, go all out and pleasure ourselves. It does not work out. Neither does it work to go the other way. Like, like a monk sitting in some monastery. I do not believe that is right. 
I believe that's just as far off as the other way. So between somewhere, there's this difficult path that is righteous and holy. That's just two extremes. And we can help one another. So these are just little things I think are wisdom. I, because because they, they're not, we cannot just nail everything down and have like one rule for the rest of our lives. God could have done that. He kind of did that in the Old Testament, I think. Like, don't do this. Well, they did it. Don't serve other gods. They did it. Jesus came and he, he said, if we want to repent, he didn't say that, but I'm saying if we want to repent, he wants us. He wants, he wants to find somebody that's willing to, willing to serve him. He doesn't want somebody that doesn't want him would rather have the pleasures of this life now. He doesn't want that person. He wants somebody that has repented, somebody that is seeking him. And he's, there's, I think it's Old Testament, but I like it because it says God, God's eyes go over the whole earth seeking to find someone that he can make himself strong to. Isn't that, isn't that nice? Isn't that beautiful? God is seeking for somebody to make himself strong to you. I believe he's still doing that. But in our selfishness, we forget who our king is so often. And I know you all can add uh, a whole bunch of, uh, of your own list of things. That, and, and like I said, none of us quite walk that same path. But we need to walk that path close enough together where we can walk together. Otherwise, there's contention and, and it has to be figured out. Part of that is to be able to be forgive. Without forgiveness, we will not see God. He will forgive us as we forgive others. I guess before I had even mentioned about, I had intended to give a little lesson on uh, not being distracted on the road. All of, all of us that have driven on the road probably can relate sometimes when we became distracted and it was dangerous. It is not, it's not a good idea to go down the road distracted. This is again just, uh, I think, wisdom of uh, not allowing... Um, now my memory is too bad, but I, I think in the driver's manual it would say either one second or three seconds that you can look to the side. I, somebody ought to know here. Somebody know whether it's one second or three seconds? Three. That's pretty long. Okay. I kind of thought it was three, but I thought that's kind of a long time. I wonder if you can look that way. Anyways, so three is... It's the longest you want to go. Three seconds, you look off the side, you see something very interesting, very quickly, there's five seconds gone. Sometimes you start drifting. Sometimes the road turns. Sometimes another car is coming at you. And where I find that distract, uh, distraction very, very uh, wakening is when a car stops in front of me. That's, and you miss a few seconds. That really gets me. Like, I think it's kind of city driving. Out in the country, you don't really experience that. You're kind of going along, you look at all these things to look at, and next thing you know, the car's in front of you stopped and it's, or slowed down. It, it's not a good idea. And then the other thing that I know is a big problem is the phone. 
I don't know if you all use the phone and drive, but I do. Uh, there is a way to keep your focus first on the road and keep all the rest of the stuff secondary. There is a way, but you have to be very diligent. And still you can't look away more than three seconds because that will bring destruction. There's only a matter of a few more seconds and, and you'll often be in big trouble. Um, but I see people going down the road a lot of times and they're texting. I think some are watching movies. I think just about anything. Um, we have to be really careful. It'll distract us for more than three seconds. It's better. Some of those things are better not to do. Eating is another thing that distracts people. They say, I, for some reason, that doesn't seem to distract me as much. Uh, I've always been able to. If there's nobody around, I check, and then I get something. Um, I never, I always try to keep in mind not to... Uh, not to let my attention be anywhere else, but still have it on the road. Even though I look down for just a little bit and then feel for something without looking away. Spiritually, um, spiritually we've been told to keep our focus on Christ. Not turn our eyes to the left nor to the right. I think something very similar would be if somebody distracts us for a moment from Christ, but get our focus back on the way. Get our focus back to what Jesus taught. It is the only safe way and the only way that we can obtain our goal to eternal life. There's no other way, there's no other name, there's no other, there's no other thing that we can have that will get us to eternal life. Only, only the King Jesus, only His kingdom, His teachings, His ways. And we, we go over His teachings all the time, continually, and I don't feel like going over a bunch of them. It's um, in Hebrews eleven. I I thought of. Um, Just how serious we are. I, this is one thing I really appreciate about all of you is I think most of us here have a fair amount of convictions about a lot of these these um, natural distractions that so often want to distract us from walking in 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 harmony with one another, in harmony with with God. Um, And here's, there's this, uh, in Hebrews 11, very, I um, always found this fascinating. Something that i not sure what all it means, but it means something pretty serious. So, uh, beginning, Hebrews 11, 13, all of these, I think he was talking about, well, I'm not sure he was talking about, all of these died in faith without having received the promises. But from a distance they saw and greeted them. They confessed they were strangers and foreigners on the earth. 
For people who speak in this way make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. If they had been thinking of the land that they had left behind, they would have had opportunity to return. We can go back to our old ways if we want. We don't have the press on. It's too hard. It costs, it costs our everything. If they had been thinking of the land that they had left behind, they would have had opportunity to return. We're, we're allowed to return any time we want. But as it is, they desire a better country. That is a heavenly one. Therefore God is not ashamed to be called their God. Indeed, he has prepared a city for them. This is what we want. This is what we want. We have to think about these things. It's not, it's not something that gets handed to us. We cannot, we cannot be grandfathered in us to say. We have to take a hold of it ourselves. Therefore God is not ashamed to be called their God. And it's because we make our vision Christ's vision. This world that was left behind, we... We don't want to turn back to it. There's nothing there to be had. We can have pleasure. We can... I mean, we know it all over the place. People use it in their clothing, their cars, their trucks, their houses. Try to make something that makes people impressed. Is God impressed with it? We need to think about these things. We're in attention. We can't just... Go whole for it. Everything, put our heart just, well, I'm going to buy all any cereal I want. I'm going to just do with my phone what I want. I'm going to just drive any truck that I can, put in the biggest motor, uh, big tires, be something, ride high. This is the spirit behind all these things. We don't have to live that way. I think in some of these ways, I know in some of these ways it's easy to tell. Um, no, we don't, we, don't, we don't use the things that make people, oh, I, that's something that I want. Unless it's the beauty of Christ. We want that to happen. Oh, we have a good, we, we have a good marriage. We have good communication. We have children that obey. We have... We have... Um, We have order in our home. We have order with our place. These are things people seek for, but it takes discipline. These things do not come by themselves. Usually. We need to seek for them. They do not... All these good things that God has given us, we have to embrace and make them part of ourselves. I guess I'll read verse 16 again. But as it is, or maybe 15, if they had been thinking of the land that they had left behind, they would have had opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country. That is a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God. And indeed, he has prepared a city for them. When we do the things he taught us, he's not ashamed of us. When we try to pursue our own things or pursue to uh, get the honor of man, he's ashamed of us. 
But when we express his name, his ways, he's not ashamed of us. He's not ashamed of, I forget where it's at, but uh, he's not ashamed to call us to be our God. And I want to read uh, Revelations 21, 4 to 8. Maybe 3. Starting at 3, verse uh, Revelation 21. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, See, the home of God is among mortals. He will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Mourning and crying and pain will be no more. For the first things have passed away. These things we're experiencing now, we're not going to experience there. I don't know, maybe there's some things we will, but I'm not sure what it will be. Death we won't experience there. Mourning we won't experience there. Crying and pain will be no more. For these things have passed away. It will be no more. And the one who is seated on the throne said, See, I'm making all things new. Also he said, Write this, for these words are trustworthy and true. Then he said to me, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give water as a gift from the spring of the water of life. And those who conquer will inherit these things, and I will be their God, and they will be my children. But as for the cowardly, the faithless, the polluted, the murderers, the fornicators, the sorcerers, the idolaters, and all liars, their place will be in that lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. And then verse 25 to the end, Its gates will never be shut by day, and there will be no night there. People will bring into it the glory and the honor of the nations, but nothing unclean will enter it, nor anybody who practices, practices abomination or falsehood, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. May the Lord bless each of us, and I'll open it up for corrections or comments. Thank you, brother. I appreciated that. Uh, maybe one correction. I, I think I misunderstood what you're saying. Uh, look away for three seconds or one second. I thought you were talking about when you're driving and you need to turn and then you look down this way and then you look down that way. I think you, you might look down that way for three seconds before you pull out. Uh, but you are more so saying like, how long do you look off to the side of the road? I don't know. I'm not sure. Maybe one second would be better than three seconds but I'm sorry I, I didn't I I think I just spoke too soon on that one um, I had a thought though about just being distracted when I was a younger Christian I would constantly get distracted but it wasn't with it wasn't with so much with what I could see it was more so with what I could imagine like my imagination would just just go wandering all day I'd be riding my bike down the street and I'd just start thinking about these things and um, I had to really just focus I think God showed me like to just really start focusing on what's right in front of me when that would happen to me I just had to say there's a tree and there's a brick um, there's there's leaves it's green it's sunny like I had to just like make everything in front of me come alive and then it just it like closed up my imagination and all the distractions um, but there is one verse that it makes me think of in the book of Ecclesiastes. Um, the wise man's eyes are in his head, but the fool walketh in darkness. And I myself perceived also that one event happeneth to them all. So like, what would happen to me is I would get, in my imagination, I would just be in darkness, you know, I'd just be wandering in my mind. But the, fool, the wise man's eyes are in his head, like he's just right there, he's focusing on what's right in front of him. Um, it really helped me. But anyways, I appreciated that. Thank you. God bless you. <clears throat> Thank you, Brother Walter. Uh, 
as they say in Spanish, un día a la vez, <clears throat> one day at a time, and that was a, one day at a time. We, we're not promised tomorrow. You know, today's the first day of the rest of our life. Yeah, it could be the last day of the rest of our life too, right, Brother Dijon? 82 years old on Thursday, I know. But uh, on, on the cell phone, Michael Ostringer gave the best thing I've ever saw on the cell phone a few years ago. I mean, I wanted to tear up every cell phone in the whole world after reading Michael's thing against the smartphone and the cell phone, and it's great. And I use it for work, it's for directions, but Michael's was great. That was very radical. I mean, that's great. I think that I've had my wife read it to me maybe three times. Yeah, it was, that's great. Some people, <coughs> they won't drink soda. They make a vow, I'm never gonna drink soda for the rest of my life, it's no good. It's just sugar and it takes away, well, I don't know it takes away brain cells, but it's just no good, soda pop. I agree with that, but I, once every five years, I will drink soda, just to make someone happy, I guess, I don't, I, I, you can't, I just can't make a vow that I'm never gonna drink soda again the rest of my life, even though it's poison, basically, I mean, what can I say? My last comment would be on numbers, in the book of numbers, well, the Norman talked about Balaam. We don't want to be like, we learn from Balaam. Great lesson, Balaam, Balaam, don't be like Balaam. Oh, please, never let us be like Balaam, Lord. I love of money, but uh, there's also a few people in the book of Numbers who are heroes. Of course, Walter mentioned Joshua and Caleb. Of course, there's Phineas. Phineas got the javelin and the Lord, like you said, the eyes of the Lord moved to and fro throughout the earth. He said, Look at this guy, and he made an everlasting covenant with Phineas. And then there's also in the last chapter, <clears throat> There's five people to mention, and I'm going to throw it out, see if any of your brothers know. The five daughters of Zelophehad, <clears throat> and they're noted for their courage. Does anyone know why they're noted for their courage? Michael, why are they pointed out? The five daughters of Zelophehad, they're noted for their courage. What did, what so, they just said, we want land because our father has died, and we have this, we don't have a husband and all this, and, and Moses said, went to God, God says, you got it, but you got to be submissive, you got to marry people from a different tribe, and they did. But they're noted for their courage. Why, Leroy? What's so? Anyone? Why, why? Why is it five daughters of Zelophehad? Last chapter of Numbers. Five daughters of Zelophehad. They are models to be courageous. Because they said, come on, anyone want to say it? Yanni, you know. When you go in and conquer that land, not like the other ten spies, when you conquer that land, then we want this. They had the courage, they had the foresight. When you conquer that land, get the, the land from the Canaanites, then we want that land. That was their courage. And we should be like that too, we know. We should have that courage, even though it wasn't conquered yet. The five daughters of Zelophehad were great heroes. And you know, Taylor, you got five. Norman, you got five. Walter, you got five. Dwayne, buddy, you got five, five. The girls, four. I'm counting, I'm, I'm counting. <laughs> the Lord be magnified. Just appreciate just uh, you sharing practical advice and wisdom. I just wanted to make a short comment about something you said early in the message about Calvary and um, about the power if we have already died or are willing to die, like the the... That, that song was on my mind kind of all morning, like, uh, mercy, there was great and grace was free, pardon, there was multiplied to me. There my burdened soul found liberty at Calvary. Um, and there is a liberty, as, as Walter said, a liberty, a freedom, and a power that go with, uh, with dying being willing to die, dying to self. I had to think of two people in particular in the Old, Old, Old Testament. Esther, who, who looked, at the, looked at the situation in front of her and said, okay, there's, there's one thing to do, and if I perish, I perish. Um, and there was, there, there was her, there was her, in, in that lay a, a lot of her ability to just do the right thing. Um, and and then also Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who who uh, said to said to the king, <clears throat> "Yeah, it it's up to you whether you want to throw us in the fire. I mean, you even even if even if we even our God can save us, but even if He doesn't, just know we're not going to do do this 
wicked thing you're asking from us or this idolatrous thing and and therein was their strength their power it was it was in fact it was so powerful that that was it king nebuchadnezzar i think like he i mean his his countenance changed like here was a here was a strength and power he had not yet met up with it seems like uh he was super furious um and and uh Anyway, I was, I was blessed to think about those things. and Jesus set an example for us on how to, um, how to think about death and was willing to go as a sheep to the slaughter without opening his mouth. So, anyway, thanks. <clears throat> yeah, thank you, Walter, for sharing that. Um, just a few things really stood out to me. Um, just the things that you said made me think of Jesus speaking on the Sermon on the Mount. He said, uh, the light of the body is the eye. If therefore the eye be single, the whole body is full of light. Um, if therefore the eye be dark, the whole body is full of darkness. And I think that there's something important about that. He was speaking, just making his comments. He was just making principles of life come come to light I think by saying those things it's obvious it's not just a, uh, Jesus wasn't speaking about just um, hey I'm going to write some things down do this and you shall live or something like that he was speaking about a path to enter in um, things to figure out being wise not foolish um, understanding the gravity of letting our eyes go one way or the other. I mean, it's so true. Our eyes just are, they are the light of the body. It's what we do to make sure we don't step on prickles and make sure we don't step on nails with the, you know, sticking out of boards or, or stumble over rocks or trees or, you know, it's, our eyes are there to, to look out for us. And, I mean, just ask a blind man, he can verify that real quick. Um, so, Jesus used those true, real things to point out spiritual things as well. And we do well to go by them, or live up to them, or at least be challenged by them. I was challenged by them. God bless you all. I was thinking about those five daughters I've heard uh, I guess you'd say willful willful women use them as an example of like the um, virtue to to speak up and and uh, and want land and <clears throat> they didn't the, those ladies didn't want land they wanted they wanted their father's name to not be forgotten uh, I've thought how sometimes because of a uh, it's a lack of humility it's like pride and a desire um, a desire for fame that causes somebody to get up get up in front of a bunch of people and speak they love it they love standing up in front of everybody that's because it's because they lack humility and then and then you got Moses he's an example of somebody like it was it was his humility because he was humble like he didn't want to get up and lead this people but because he was so humble he did it sometimes it's it's a person's if God wants you to get up if the right thing is to get up and speak it can be a lack of humility that would cause somebody to not get up and speak to not speak up to stay sitting down like it's the humility that would cause somebody to get up and do it was right and I um, Looking again at those at those ladies, I mean, if um, God was pleased with what they said and what they did, um, I, I I imagine that they were. Uh, I'm, I'm total speculation. I'm imagining they were meek, humble women that behaved out of character for a woman to get up and and be making this plea, 
uh, it was because it was because it was the right thing to do. God God heard him and said, "Yeah, that's right. If a, if a man dies and doesn't have an inheritance, God was concerned about his inheritance. God wasn't even trying to give these ladies land. God was concerned about, and he, he made provisions uh, for the future. Um, so these these ladies that um, that feminists will use as uh, as examples of being bold women were, are are actually uh, models of humility. Like it was, they they behaved out of character. To, to do what was right, and I, um, um, I just wanted to point that out, and then also I uh, really appreciated, I guess the same thing <clears throat> Dwayne brought out, there's liberty, um, I'm not trying to justify that song, <laughs> but there's a, there's a truth there that when uh, there's freedom in, in being dead to self and de dead to self stuff, it's like that's where, um, that's where the flesh and the enemy get us. Like if we want, that's where temptation gets its leverage. When we want pleasure, when we want ease, when we want fame, when we want stuff and to be esteemed and like this. Um, if we don't want any of those things, then what, what can the enemy do? How, I mean, how can, it's like, it's like you're a slippery fish or like something you can't get any leverage on. Uh, um, and that, you know, that's how people that's why people cover up sin, because uh, they're they're concerned about reputation or or something like that. If we're just free from those things, then um, what the enemy, you know, he says, "Well, I'll give you this," and you say, "I don't want that." Well, I'll make this happen. Well, uh, that's fine. Well, I'll take your life. Okay, <laughs> you know, he's like, mm, "What can I, what can I do to this guy? Like, how do I, how do I get him to do wrong?" Like, if we're free of those things. Then we're free. Yeah, when Dwayne mentioned the characters in the Old Testament, I, I don't think I said it, either I thought it or started to, started to say it, but um, I'm always impressed with King David out in the, tending, out in the field tending those sheep, and he was willing to lose his life for those sheep. I, I. I think that's part of what was his, one of his good characters. And uh, by being willing to just lay down his life for a small animal, God blessed him with strength and what he needed. Um, I think it's still the same today.